Hello, this is Angela with Pergos Permaculture. It is a very warm, sunny afternoon here in Portland, Oregon, unseasonably warm, and I am tending to one of my favorite garden culinary tasks. Now, in permaculture, we, it, well, with any gardening, we have to follow the seasonality of the year. We have to work with nature, with how she is progressing, and when she is presenting things to us at the peak of ripeness, the peak of flavor. And that isn't always on our schedule. So I had other plans for this weekend, but if I don't take care of this job right now, I'm gonna miss my window of opportunity. So today my garden task is to make elderflower syrup. And I will use this in drinks where I mix it with bubble water or I make a cocktail and I can make a sorbet with it. It has all of that essence of the flavor of spring, all of those floral notes. There's nothing like elderflower syrup. And it's only available to make for a short period of time in the spring when the elders are in bloom. Now I grow, well I used to grow, three different kinds of elders, two black elders and one blue elder. Let's talk about those briefly because if you want to make elderflower syrup and elderflower cordial, pretty much the only way to do that is to grow your own elders. So elderberries are obviously a well-known culinary and medicinal crop. Black elders, Sambucus nigra, are native to Europe and I grow two types, Nova and York. They are well-known, commercial, consistent producers of large elderberries with good flavor. There is a lot of diversity of aroma and flavor among black elders. Much like if you grow apples from seed, you don't know what kind of apple you're gonna get off of it. The same thing with elderberries. They can have notes of coffee all the way to licorice, all the way to kind of insipid flavors, um, to obviously that unique characteristic elderberry taste. If you grow a York or a Nova, you will get that taste for which the elderberry is known. For the two varieties that I have that are black elder, they grow in my shade woodland garden. Let me show you what they look like in the context of this garden. Now, I personally, when I planted these, I was told they would top out at eight to 12 feet. They are incredibly happy. And personally, if I had to do it over again, I would pick a different spot to grow them because I know they encroach over the fence onto my neighbor's yard. They're so happy. They are huge despite yearly pruning. But let me show you what they look like. So as you walk through that woodland garden, the aroma of those elders in flower is just, wow. I grew them specifically in this space because I knew they would produce in shade, but also because um, the two larger bedrooms that we have on the first floor are on that wall. And so in the springtime, you sleep with the windows open and the aroma of elder flowers wafts in on the evening breeze and it's just, so soothing and so wonderful and there's nothing like it. So when I plant for my permaculture design, I am often thinking about experiences beyond just the yield of food, the yield of the sensory aromatic experience of an elder is absolutely worth having in your garden. That is a yield you cannot produce anywhere else except in the home garden. Now, I also used to grow way in the back of my garden back here back by my chicken coop, the native blue elder, which is Sambucus nigra subspecies cerulea, or sometimes categorized as its own separate species, Sambucus cerulea. They produce much larger hands of very large berries that have what's called a bloom on them, much like a blueberry has a, it's truly like a, almost a black berry, but has a white bloom on it. 
The Sambucus cerulea is the same. It's a blackberry with a white bloom that gives it a blue cast. I personally think Sambucus cerulea has a superior flavor. It produces extremely large hands of flowers and fruit. The reason that I don't grow it anymore is that when I ordered it from the catalog, um, it right off the bat, I think came from the nursery with elderberry cane borer. And it has struggled with dieback every single year. And when I prune it, I can see that it has cane borer. So I ultimately last year took it out and I'm going to be replanting another one. Now I don't grow it near the house because Sambuca cerulea gets to be 25 feet tall. It is what I would call in my garden where I keep everything diminutive, I would call it an overstory shrub. So for this recipe, I'll put the recipe in the description. You're going to need 15 hands of elderflowers, okay? And they just, they smell amazing. And that aroma will get transported into the syrup that you're going to make. So just, oh, so great. Cannot overstate how much I love having elderflower cordial. So when harvesting your blossoms, you want to clip the hands about like this. Now, elderflowers are safe to eat when made into fritters or in cordial, things like this, but the roots, stems, branches, and leaves and seeds of the elder all contain cyanogenic glycosides. They can make you quite sick if you consume a lot of them. So be sure that when you are cooking your um, elderflowers, you are not including any of the woody stems. In fact, if you want to be extra careful, I tend to take my hands and pinch them off until these little sections like this and avoid using any of the stem. So I will discard this part after I've clipped it off the tree. This will go in the compost and these will go into my syrup. Now, cooking helps render the elderberries much more edible for humans and they have lots of beneficial medicinal qualities. But you just wanna remember, you don't wanna consume the raw stems with your flowers and you don't wanna consume the raw seeds or juice that has been juiced with the stems. So after I take my elderberry hands and I clip off the extra stems here, I want to rinse these because sometimes there might be aphids in them there might be the occasional little spider or just dust. So you wanna pinch all of these off and then rinse them in some ice water. And then we'll be ready for the next step. To make this syrup, you're going to need um, sugar, water, you'll need lemons. These are from my Meyer lemon tree and lemon juice. You can scale this recipe up or down. Please look at the ratios in the description. Now, if you don't have extra lemon juice, some folks use citric acid powder. I prefer, because I have an abundance of lemons on my lemon tree, to just use what I have on hand and not go out and purchase anything else. So first you need to boil your water. In this case, I used four cups of water and three cups of sugar, and you want to make a syrup. So I have that here, very hot. Now, if you want to, you can boil the lemons with the sugar and the water. I have found it really hasn't added or taken away from the flavor because this is going to steep together for 48 hours anyway. So I have all of my lemons added to my sugar water. I wanna add my lemon juice. So to my scalding hot bowl of lemons, sugar, water, and lemon juice, I'm going to add all of my elder blossoms. Now it may seem like you need to add a lot, 15 elder flowers for four cups of water is quite a lot. But if you look at my elderberry plants, there are hundreds and hundreds of hands of flowers right now. Each of my elderberries the last few years has produced more than 20 pounds of fruit each. So there's no uh, shortage of yield for me by taking some and making elderflower syrup. I'm still getting far more elderberries. I usually share them with friends um, than I could possibly consume myself. Keep in mind that 
the elderberries themselves freeze really well. You can dehydrate them, which also helps break down the cyanogenic glycosides in them. By the same token, you can freeze this cordial when you are done into ice cube trays, and then it's great to add to a glass of scotch in the evening or to make into recipes later in the year. It will keep for four to six weeks in the refrigerator as is, but I try and make enough to freeze half, and that way I can use it later in the heat of summer. There's nothing like having an elderflower cordial come August on a hot, hot August evening. So I have my elderflowers added here. I don't know if you can see my hands are covered in pollen. Hover this with a plate or a towel and let it sit in the kitchen for 24 hours. And then I want to put it in the fridge for another 24 hours. I want to give a long time for those flavors to marry together, to meld together. And then I'm going to strain it and I'm going to put it into a jar and keep it in the refrigerator for four to six weeks. The finished product should be aromatic. The lemon will add brightness and a slight yellow color to the finished cordial. Now, you also could take this and add a significant amount more sugar and make a thick syrup from the get-go. I prefer to keep it a little bit less than a simple syrup ratio, and that way it's not so sugary that I can't just add a little bit of bubble water. But really, you're welcome to play around with the ratio of water to sugar. It's not crucial because we're not canning this product. So whatever works for you is going to be the right recipe. But for me, I will post my recipe down in the description below. I've been making this for 12 years every spring, sharing it with friends, enjoying it fresh or frozen, all season long. So thank you for watching. If you got something out of this video, please be sure and give it a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel to learn more about cooking from the garden, permaculture, and sustainable living. I also have a Patreon you can check out if you would like to support me on a monthly basis. Thanks.